Bienvenidos, Husham Deed, and welcome to another supplemental video and tutorial solution set for Lab 2.1.6.9 from the Cisco Networking Academy Introduction to Python course. In this lab, we're going to be focusing on the input function along with the print function, and we're going to be doing some basic mathematical operations. So let's dive into Lab 2.1.6.9. Now, we're also going to get to do what we referred to as functional composition, where we have one function inside another function. And the way we're going to set this up, it's actually going to be typecasting as well, because we're going to be taking that default value that the input function would return, which is a string, and we're going to be converting that Per the instructions right here, input a float value for variable A here, right? And so that's our comment section. You can see here the level of difficulty easy, five to 10 minutes to complete. So let's go ahead and dive in here and talk about some of these different aspects of the input function and function composition and the typecasting we're going to see happen. Now, we just finished up talking about comments. So what you could do is you could throw some additional comments in here and um, you know, put in your information, et cetera, or cut and paste from some sort of a template that you might have. And now let's go ahead and input a float value for variable A. Well, I'm gonna go ahead and say float underscore A. Now, that should make it very clear, again, self-commenting code. When I look at that variable name, I'm inclined to think that if someone named it float underscore A, that this is probably of data type float, right? Or from class float as a data type as the float. So let's go ahead now and let's first start with the input command, right? So I'm gonna say, please enter a float value. Now, we're missing something. We've got the variable name. We have the assignment operator, the equal sign. We have the input function right here that's gonna prompt the user to enter a float value. The problem is, is that remember, the input function returns a string. How can we validate that? Let's come over to the interactive interpreter in the integrated development learning environment, idle. So let me create that same statement. I'm gonna say float A, the assignment operator, and then we're gonna use the input function and I'm gonna say, please enter a float value. All right, when I hit enter, we're gonna be prompted to enter a float value. So I'm gonna put 3.14, oops, sorry, 3.14. All right, and we'll hit enter. So now when I say float underscore A, you'll notice that when it prints it out, we've got these little single quotes around it, indicating that it's a string. What is the function that we can use to validate the data type that we're currently working with here? You've got it, it's the type function. And then I simply put in here float underscore A. Again, a good self-commenting name for a variable name that makes it very clear that this should be a float value. But the input function always returns a string by default. So let's go back over to the lab in Firefox. And you can see here we've got everything working as we would anticipate in terms of prompting the user for the value, reading the value into the variable, we're just missing one minor component here. And that component is our function composition where we want to make sure that what gets returned from the input function is cast to a float. And you can see all we did was enclose the input function text inside the float function. And again, there's our function composition and we are casting the default data type of a string to a float. So that should take care of entering float value A. Let's come over here and let's see, does that actually work? So if I was to say float underscore A, use the assignment operator and then say float open parens 
input open parens. And this is where it might become a little confusing for learners with the multiple parentheses that are being used, but it might even be good to show them what it looks like here and then say, just simply take the input and drop it into the float function. And then it maybe visually for them, it's gonna be a little easier. So enter a float value. And so there it is. And we've got two parentheses, we are done. So I'm gonna hit enter. I'll say 3.14, hit return. If I was to say float A, we can see that the individual, or I should say the uh, single quotation marks around our value from this variable are no longer there. And the final validation here is going to be to definitively tell you what data type does the variable float A refer to. And there you have it. It's a data type of class float. All right, so we've got our code right here. So if that's the code for float A, and let me actually go ahead and pull this back here. This should be pretty straightforward in terms of creating another self-commenting variable name with the assignment operator and say float uh, input. And let's say, please enter another float value. And there we go. So we now have the two input statements. We've got the float function, or I should say the input function, we've got the float function that is now typecasting, changing that default data type that's returned from the input function from a string to a float. And now we just want to walk through addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Now, should we do it in this order? Why don't we follow PEMDAS, right? Parentheses, exponentiation, and then the M is multiplication. And remember, the multiplication results in a product. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's print the results out here. So I'm going to say, print the product of float underscore A and float underscore B is, and I'll put my um, colon there, and then we're gonna put a comma, and so, all I'm doing is multiplying float A times float B. So let's just go ahead and say float underscore A, the multiplication symbol, and float underscore B. Now, we have our first equation here. Before you work through all of these, again, I'm a huge proponent of breaking things down into small digestible chunks where we might end up with some code that we can reuse. So let's grab all of this here and let's see what happens when we go for a run of that program in here. Let's see if we have everything we need for a functional program with just the first line there, because then it makes the subsequent three lines we're gonna be dealing with of output a little bit easier to tackle. Instead of writing all of that code, then running it, finding multiple errors, maybe there's multiple problems there, and then it just becomes a little bit more confusing. So again, inductive approach, small steps. We'll hit F5, I'll save it. And do we have a typo of any kind? Let's find out. So I'll say 5.0 and then 3.14. And there we go. Now, we're gonna add a little bit to this, right? We're gonna spice up this output a little bit here because that is kind of unmanageable from a visual perspective, right? Now, it goes out many, many decimal places, but what if I wanted to round that? And again, we've seen the round function in previous labs, but we'll come back to the round in just a second. So the next thing that we wanna do is we wanna come back over to our browser here. Because now that we know that we've got a, a formula that works here, let's go ahead and take care of what happens after multiplication, division, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and say print, and when we do division, it's the uh, dividend. So the dividend of float underscore A and float underscore B is, and then we'll step out here and I'll say float underscore A, and then we'll divide it by float underscore B. Now, the assumption here, and we might even come back up here, enter a 
positive float value, right? And then another positive float value. Maybe if we want to deal with positive numbers, we can indicate that. But we're going to go ahead and say float A divided by float B. And that is, oops, sorry, that is going to be our dividend. And so let's get rid of division here. And then after division comes addition. And so then let's go ahead and add in the addition of float A and float B. And so we're going to say print. And again, you can see now it's kind of cookie cutter, right? As long as we get the operator correct, along with no typos in our operands, it's going to be pretty cut and dry. So when we do, uh, what do we do in addition? The sum. The sum of float underscore A and float underscore B is... And then we step right out here and we say float underscore A plus float underscore B. And then we're going to come down and do the last one, which is going to be, uh, I'm sorry, we should have done, what do we do? PEMDAS, uh, multiplication we did, uh, DA for addition and then subtraction. Okay, good. So we've got subtraction last. So when we do subtraction, we're talking about the difference. So we're going to say the difference of float underscore A and float underscore B is, and then we simply come out here and say float underscore A minus float underscore B. And so all of this code that we have here should work over in our file that's part of this interactive session that we're kind of running, but we've got a file that we've created over here. So let's see, give us a little more real estate here on that. So let's see if we run this, does this work as we anticipate and as we expect? So let's hit F5, let's hit OK or click OK. Now I'll keep this simple in terms of math. So I'll say 3.0 and 4.0, right? And we'll see what we get. So the product of three times four is 12. The dividend, right, it's three-fourths or 0.75. Uh, and you've got the sum of three plus four is seven, and then three minus four is negative one. And then it says, that's all, folks. So right now, the code works. You'll notice we ran into kind of an issue here with the 3.14. So what we might want to do is what? Some more function composition. And so what we could come up here and do if we wanted to round, since we're using floats, I could come up here and try to round this to two decimal places, right? And so the product was where we saw that first. So let's rerun this with F5. I'll click OK. And I'm going to put the same values in 5 point. Oops, sorry. Let me click over here. We're going to say 5.0. And then I'm going to say 3, oops, sorry, 3.14. And let's see, did it round it off? And it did, and you can see that it rounded it. It doesn't give us the second, second uh, decimal spot because it rounded it down to 15.7, right? So you can see we end up with 15.7, but now take a look here. The dividend, we've got some challenges, and the difference, we have some challenges. So what we would want to do is kind of keep this universal, and let's do some more function composition here, and we're going to say comma two, and then come down and do the same thing for this one. We're going to say round, and then comma two. And it's rounding it based off of that second character, or the, I should say the second digit past the decimal spot. And then round, and we'll come out here. Whoops comma two and one more parent. And so there is our functional program. Let's hit F5 for the final run. Let's step over here for my positive value. I'm gonna say 5.0 and then 3.14. And what we see is everything got rounded down to that, oops, sorry, jumped a little bit there, to that second decimal spot. And you can see right there that it rounded the second decimal spot based off of the value over here. So that 15.7, it was already 15.7, uh, you know, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. So that got rounded out and it just didn't print that up because it's just going to be a zero, right? And so there we go. 
We've got a functional program here. We've seen how we can use the input function to prompt the user for input, how we can typecast that input from the default data type of a string to a float, assign it to a variable name, and then use the print function in order to print out the result of these equations we have down here at the right. Again, product for multiplication, dividend for division, sum for addition, and difference for subtraction. And that is all. So that is going to do it for this lab on Simple Input and Output Lab 2.1.6.9. Stay happy, stay healthy, and I hope to see you in the next video. Have a good afternoon.